Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. It's so wonderful that nowadays when somebody says that they're going to a therapist, you don't get a weird look. Back in the day, somebody would say that, like, oh, somebody's got a little problem there. No, now it's like a badge of honor or courage. Like, yeah, I'm going to go talk to my therapist, which is wonderful. Let's take that a couple of layers deeper. Were you aware that therapy also resides with music, drama, art, the arts? They're all uh, majorly therapeutic. The proof in that is an organization which is located in the greater New York City area. It's called Baltic Street Into Action. Today, we're going we're gonna to look at drama therapy and how it supports so many, even those with PTSD. Peter Jampel is our professional of the year, and he is the president of Baltic Street Into Action, and he's back with us. Hey, Peter. Steve, nice to be back with you. Great to have you back here. Learned a lot about all of us. And you know, loosely, I personally have heard that the arts can be therapeutic, had no idea how deep that role <laughs> at all. And I've learned it through you, how it helps people with, of course, mental challenges, uh, those who are incarcerate, uh, incarcerated and more. You have a guest with us today. Who do we have? Um, it's my pleasure to have on today's podcast, uh, Dr. David Johnson. Um, I think David's uh, background and his areas of, of clinical practice uh, really address some of the issues you've just talked about, Steve. Yeah, maybe, you know, um, people are less uh, reluctant to enter therapy or talk about being in therapy, but many people who have uh, experienced serious trauma um, are struggling to be able to come to, to terms with what took place in their lives. And David's uh, career, uh, he and I go back 40 years um, over many professional adventures together. Uh, and, and David's career spans uh, an enormous uh, leap and development in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, uh, he's going to outline some of these areas. He worked in the Veterans Administration in uh, New Haven for many years. Um, he has uh, had his own uh, practice in the post-traumatic stress uh, center for 42 years. Um, he's, he worked in the Newtown school system after the tragic um, violent, uh, you know, catastrophe that occurred with those young school children. And this has informed his current work, which uh, we'll uh, get to, uh, called the, um, um, the Miss, Tell It to Miss Kendra Project, which works with school-aged children who struggle to uh, deal with their anxieties and fears. So, David, thank you so much for joining our podcast today. I'm really glad to be able to share your experience with our listeners. Thank you, Peter and Steve. I'm looking forward to it. So, David, um, you know, we have touched on work with, with veterans in this podcast before we're Baltic Street into Action is currently supporting a project uh, uh, in Manhattan and Brooklyn with veterans in terms of a theater production and the uh, the ability to tell their stories through the um, collective strength and support and collaboration of working as a theater troupe, um, David. Uh, let's start with, if you would, your experiencing your experience in working with veterans um, in in the Veterans Administration Hospital. Well, <clears throat> I had the privilege of starting at the VA in 1979, and <clears throat> that was a year before 
uh, PTSD was put into the DSM, 1980. So I was present when people with working with Vietnam veterans began to realize that a lot of the symptoms and illnesses we thought they had were not those things, but were actually PTSD. And <clears throat> In 1979, get this, it was not standard practice at the VA to ask a veteran coming in for psychiatric treatment whether they had served in combat. Wow. We didn't even ask them. And the reason for that is that we had no theory that would say that being in combat or not in combat would have anything to do with having bipolar, schizophrenia, depression, or whatever. So why do you need to ask about it? And within a couple of years, people began to go, you know what? Now that there's this new diagnosis, we need to ask them, have you been in combat? <laughs> and so the moment we began to ask them, have they been in combat? We suddenly discovered that their symptoms were directly related to what they had experienced, duh. And it's like an unbelievable situation where for decades, veterans in our hospitals were being mistreated, given medications that didn't work, diagnosed with schizophrenia, bipolar, borderline personality disorder, when they did not have those conditions. Some of them being hospitalized for months and years for conditions that they did not have. It made me so upset that I actually went over to the nursing home care unit at the VA where all the old World War II vets were, all of whom had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and these kinds of things, and did an interview with all of them and discover that they all had PTSD too um, from the war. And um, I'll just give you a perfect example of <clears throat> what, what happened, which just highlights the importance of of the avoidance that society has around these topics and which we'll get to in the other topics, which is there was one veteran named John who uh, we liked and he had been on the unit several months and he would have these um, psychotic outbursts and he would sort of speak in gibberish and he would roll on the floor and hide under the, uh, uh, the sofas and whatever. And he was schizophrenic. And about five years, this was 1981, and when we didn't really, hadn't really applied our knowledge about PTSD. About five years later, I get a call from his mother. And she calls me up and says, Dr. Johnson, you know, I've lost touch with John, wondering if he has shown up at the VA at all. And I said, no, I'm sorry, he hasn't. Uh, we really cared for him and, you know, worried about what, what happened. And she said, you know, he was never the same after Nam. Mm. And in that moment, I went, he went to Vietnam. She said, oh, yeah, he was in serious combat. And in that moment, the memory of him suddenly realized that he was not speaking gibberish. He was speaking Vietnamese. And we always said it had this kind of Asian kind of thing. He was having a flashback. He wasn't having a psychotic episode. And that we had treated him for a couple of years as if he was schizophrenic and had never asked him about any of these conditions. And we had completely mistreated him. And it was like, how many, how many veterans were completely mistreated? And we're gonna get to that, which is today, the same thing is happening in our schools. You have kids doing all sorts of crazy stuff. They're being diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, ADHD, eating disorders, all these things. And is anyone asking them, have they been through any difficult experiences? No. So we don't ask them. And so they're being put on medications. They're being put on all sorts of things going on with the hope that, that this will somehow fix their behaviors or <clears throat> thinking that there's something wrong with the teachers or the curriculum or whatever. So again, we're in a situation, the same thing we were in 1980, where we have the knowledge that neglect and abuse of children is creating learning disabilities, lack of performance in the school, behavioral problems, and it's being misdiagnosed left and right 
with even bipolar now is being diagnosed in kids who were six, seven and eight years old. So they can put them on the medication, medications that won't work because they don't have bipolar. Anyway, we're in the same situation and it's like yeah. unbelievable how history is repeating itself. But it was at the VA where um, I think this moment, this kind of aha moment of realizing, my God, that John had PTSD changed everything. And we developed a unit. Um, and the problem is always, how do people talk about these experiences? Uh, it's very hard to talk about what happened in Vietnam to see your friend two feet ahead of you having his head blown off and having pieces of uh, brain matter spattered over your body. That's hard to talk about. And that's understandable. So this is where the arts come in. Because the arts are a way of indirectly expressing the horror, the, the, all the different kinds of things through music and art and drama in a way that somehow is palatable, but that still communicates what's going on. And we discovered, like many other people, that the arts therapies, and we had music therapy, poetry therapy, drama therapy, and art therapy with our veterans. We put on 27 theatrical plays uh, that they developed over the years, uh, all of which were incredibly powerful because it was about their experience, that this was an incredible way for them to be able to solve the dilemma of how do you communicate that something terrible is happening without either directly talking about it and upsetting everyone, um, uh, and yet to be able to communicate it. So uh, that was a very powerful experience. Mm, thank you for sharing that. What an eye-opener. And I don't know if you have you both have heard the George Carlin bit, if you will. Of course, he did comedy, but he had a serious message in that back in the day, this was called shell shock, shell yeah. shock. And then it was tempered down to battle fatigue and now post-traumatic stress disorder. So in, in his message, it's been watered down. And we lose the effectiveness of what is actually going on with our veterans. Um, and now, you know, it comes back to one thing, trauma. Children experience trauma. And it might be, it could be uh, the divorcing of parents. It could be the, the loss of a loved one. It's traumatic. But to your point, David, uh, those questions aren't asked. It's, uh, you know, little Jimmy has ADHD. It seems like all the pieces are there. Put them on that mat. Let's go. Let's see how that works. Uh, yeah. phenomenal. And, and, yes. And to, and to me, to give you a nuance, which is when you go into the schools, <clears throat> uh, nobody feels you can ask these questions. Right. However, however, teachers do know their kids. So when you end up, you discover that actually members of the teaching staff do know about all those things. But they don't feel they're allowed to communicate those things. So they just keep it to themselves. So actually, there is a lot of knowledge that is gained because people do interact with the parents and they hear the stories and whatever, but they don't talk about right. it. Well, there's no yeah. formal in inquiry, but right. there, sometimes there is the knowledge there and it's never put together. David, I'm just curious, what happened to John after you evolved your understanding of what was troubling him um did he improve w were there uh ways in which he was able to express himself better uh, the, you're you're touching a wound okay here because i never had any more contact with him um so he was lost whatever i have no idea what happened to him okay. but i do know and maybe he was able in another setting uh, to have his PTSD identified, that would be my hope. But uh, I feel I let him down. And believe me, you know, this is a Yale associated VA. So we were full of ourselves. Mm -hmm. We just thought we knew everything about schizophrenia. And this was like the, you know, we were all professors at the Yale and whatever, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And we knew nothing. And we were giving the wrong treatment. Uh, it was a complete error harmful and it hurt him and i to this day i i i regret it yeah mm. but like much uh, progress it's through our errors and our failures that we learn 
um, how to work better with the, the next person. Uh, David, I want to go into what happened in Newtown. Um, this is uh, hard to, to, to get to, but can you give us a picture of what you did, what you saw, and how it worked? Uh, reluctantly. <laughs> um, yeah. Newtown was particularly heinous because it was uh, a madman who went into the school, shot um, right off the bat the principal and a couple of other uh, adults who tried to block him from getting into the school, shot him dead right in the front, and then went down to two classrooms. And in the first classroom, a first grade classroom, he killed everyone with um, uh, explosive bullets so that the bullets come and then explode. So 20 out of the 21 uh, people in the room died. One little girl who was at the bottom of the pile because they were all huddled up, uh, did not get hit by a bullet and survived. Everyone else was, uh, I hate to use the term, shredded. Then he went into the next uh, room um, uh, whereupon he killed uh, five more kids. Um, but at that point, he withdrew and then ended up shooting himself in the hallway. So uh, in that room, uh, four or five kids died, and the others were witness to that. Anyway, um, this is, and they were they were kindergartners. So, you know, this is um, heinous. But the thing about dealing with trauma is that's the description of the event. A horror, the cause of PTSD is not the description of the event, like, you know, being shot up, ambushed in Vietnam. That's a label for what happened. So we, uh, like many other agencies, came in to be helpful. Uh, we had the opportunity, our team, to meet with a group of all of the parents uh, of the surviving children. And uh, so they all met with us and we did a kind of a psychoeducational thing. And a team of us were meeting with the parents who were, had gone through this horrible situation with their kids who, who were survived, but who were witnesses to this terrible thing. And what we did with the drama therapy team uh, is they went into a gymnasium and with the 20 or so kids, um, they did a turbo play session um, where they allowed the kids to just sort of move through the room while our team played, you know, various kind of tag, chase, and whatever. And when you play tag with a kid, ta kids love tag. Tag, you're it, and you're it. But when you've been uh, attacked by a gunman, and so being tagged means being shot by a gunman. The game tag takes on a different emotional thing. So when our staff began to run after the kids in a playful manner, the, the, the indirect equation of that and having Adam Lanza running after these kids came up and they were able to, in, in this case, escape and then what they ended up doing is they ganged up and then they basically attacked our drama therapists, <laughs> overcame the drama therapists who all enacted being overwhelmed. And they were able to play this stuff through in a very amazing way for over two hours. Wow. Uh, it's a way of getting to know everyone. We also met with the parents of the kids who were killed. And all I can say is that that was a black hole. Uh, the meeting was basically one of unbelievable uh, emptiness, very different. And it really taught us the significance of like survival, even if you've been traumatized versus actually losing the child. You know, it was overwhelming. Um, I We did individual work with a lot of the helpers, the most unbelievable moment for me was meeting with one of the the men who were assigned to go into the room where the 20 kids had been killed and a group of three men volunteered to go in there 
to separate and identify the bodies. And so he had spent six hours taking different pieces of children's bodies to try to locate and reattach them uh, and collect them. Uh, and I mean small body parts uh, that because the whole thing had been like shredded. So I, I don't think there's anything more stressful than that, uh, to be honest. And he, I asked him, how are you doing? This was about three weeks later. And he said, fine. <laughs> he said, I'm fine. He said it was a job. It was horrible, but I, somebody had to do it. And I, it, it was important to do for the families to be able to, they, everyone wanted their body, their, their child's body, um, so that they could bury it. Um, and of course, there's no way that he is fine. But he said, I'm fine. So there you're in a situation as a therapist where you're at an impasse. And so again, uh, I used some art therapy with him to be able to just simply go around that defense and to be able to have him draw a picture of it. And as he began to draw a picture of the scene, you know, the tears began to come because the having it be on a sheet of paper, having it be under his control, having it be having an artistic element to it, gave him the distance to be able to access uh, some of the uh, process. And, um, you know, um, I should just say that the reason that the art form is so important is that art from the beginning has been a way for humans to process trauma. Uh, those early drawings in the caves of Lausanne uh, in France are of saber-toothed tigers, of, of wild animals. And they were used to basically process uh, those traumas. The early dramatic rituals of drama and movement came as the soldiers came back from war. And then they would dance and they would process things. So art actually is the original trauma treatment. Can I share something very personal? Yes, go ahead, Steve. So when I was younger, my parents got divorced, I got bullied. To your point of art being therapeutic, I drew cartoons. Yeah. And I didn't realize that until the last couple of months that that was my therapy. Um, I'll make this very brief but I was involved in a school shooting. It was decades wow. before the one we're referring to. Uh, substitute teacher took students hostage, uh, shot the principal, shot the assistant principal, shot some students, didn't kill them, but very, very much wounded them. And then he wanted his things read on the radio. And I was picked. So from 1 p.m. until 8.22 p.m., the police would walk in and say, read this on the air. Things like my epistle to the world. I'll paint the road with carnage, Bob Wicks, or they'd walk in dedication for his dog, dedication for uh, his brother all day long. I had to do that. And he would release students without shooting them. And at a 22, he played uh, the song sticks fooling yourself. There's a line in there where it says, take your best shot and don't blow it. Don't blow it. And that's where he blew his brains out. And I look at, you know, my healing from that and my therapy uh, is this. Bringing Absolutely. This well, bringing and, this to light. Well, speaking the truth instead of speaking his filthy lies. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, if I can see for you how what you're doing is doing undoing the what because that you you were mouthing insanity. I was a puppet. But there was no in the police. Well, you were doing the, it. You were doing it so that the hostages could be released, so that the students could be released. And, but and by the way, I was 21 years old and just yeah. went full time at this major radio station, which you can hear, by the way, in New Haven. Um, I, and the and the police would say, "Here, don't mess this up." <laughs> okay, sure, no problem. Right. Um, but the whole thing comes back to. Um, the therapy involved and the arts. So I'm involved, I guess I'm involved in some form of the arts here, but that's, that's me giving back to bring these things to light and how this helps people. Cause I don't believe we all realize it, how the arts can help. Yeah. 
you know, that was a horrendous experience. Yeah. And absolutely horrendous. I, I think the, the part that um, is really important to emphasize is being able to speak the truth and not being forced to hide behind fear, anxiety, and withdrawal sure. into one's inner self uh, and increasing one's sense of isolation and ultimately desperation, which brings me, and I don't think we we probably have some time issues, but I, I want you to talk about the Miss Kendra project because this project is designed to help children bring their inner genuine, authentic truth out, which is, as we've been talking about, often masked as other things and other behaviors. So David, give us a, a sense of how the Miss Kendra project uh, works and, and what it's designed to do. Well, very simply, we created the post-traumatic stress center and it began with mostly adults and adolescents. But then we began working with the Department of Children and Families, and we got more and more children coming to us who had been exposed to trauma, neglect, and abuse years before. See, because they get exposed to it, they hide it, eventually their behaviors emerge, then they're sent into treatment, then somebody asks, and then they discover that they had had this experience, and then they get referred to treatment. It takes about four or five years, typically. And <clears throat> we have a school behind my building. Um, and I would have to drive past it around it to get to my parking lot every morning. And all the kids would be out there kind of, you know, before school, kind of hanging out. And I would come in and joke to my staff saying, these are all future patients of ours. Because um, it's going to take them time to, you know, be identified. And finally, I said, I can't take this anymore. We're sitting here four or five years down the pike, treating people after they've been abused. And I'm driving past a school where all the kids are right now. So we decided in 2007 to get into the schools and see what we could do with a trauma perspective in a normal school. And this is a huge challenge to be able to persuade a school and teachers that we can talk about difficult topics in the school day and not with a therapy context, uh, but literally a more public health approach. Just like you have billboards basically about sexual abuse and we're trying to inform the public to be aware. We wanted to inform the entire public of the school about the impact of trauma on the kids' ability to read, listen, concentrate, and to behave properly. And of course, as we all know, the schools across the country are having terrible trouble um, with behaviors and poor performances. And people are saying, let's change the teachers. People are saying, let's get new books. People are saying, we'll redesign the schools. People are going to basically fire the superintendent again. We're going to uh, you know, replace something, right? Put in a new gym. Well, guess what? The problem is not in the gym. The problem is not in the books or the curriculum or the teachers. You could replace all of them and you'd have the same problem every day because it's coming in inside the minds of the children. And getting and, worse because these children are exposed worse. to life in general, mixed families, tra trauma, drama within oh, the family. Poverty, yes. poverty all yeah. this racism. All these things are impacting it. And as long social as social media, social media, social too. media, absolutely everything. And as long as we do not address it, it will get worse. Yeah. We're, we're out of time. I, I'm, I would just, I mean, we, we just opened up a door here that we I just would love opened to, up a big door, there. a big door. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, and wonderful I, to be here. So. Thank appreciate you. It. And I appreciate you both for bringing this to light. And I completely, with our education system, David, agree with you. In fact, it's all about test scores and placement and college and all of that. Stop. <laughs> all of that. Our uh, children have uh, issues. Right. We are, the rest of us are living under an illusion. 
And people yeah. who have been traumatized are living in reality. And unless we talk to the kids about the reality, there's no hope. Yeah. So David, we'll have you back and we'll talk um, at, at another point about the work. Um, thank you so much for um, being with us and sharing the work. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Steve. And uh, um, what you're doing is very helpful to everyone. And, and both of you. I, I say the same thing back to you both. Uh, wonderful that we got to talk today. And BalticStreetIntoAction.com is the website if you want to learn more about the program. It's a nonprofit organization. And uh, again, thank you both for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'll be right back. Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, online radio box, and simple radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on MyTuner-Radio.com, or search Podcast Business News Network on Streama.com and OnlineRadioBox.com slash US. Take your podcast on the go and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day -day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's... It's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house, and there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit hfotusa.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's it's going to be okay.